Welcome to this short course on risk management for medical devices and ISO 14971. I'm Peter Sibelius and I have worked with medical device product development and risk management for 20 years now and I don't think there is anything that is more interesting to work with than that. I'm a member of the joint working group authoring the ISO 14971 standard and in this video I would like to bring you up to speed on risk management. I will be showing you what risk management is, the general requirements of risk management, risk analysis, risk evaluation and risk control, and everything that comes thereafter. You will also be briefed on the difference between ISO 49001 risk management and FMEA, and why only doing FMEA does not meet the regulatory requirements. The goals of this short course are that you should get a basic understanding of what risk management for medical devices is and why you should care about it. And based on that, you should be able to figure out if the full course on risk management that we offer on medicaldevicehq.com could help you in your job or career. The full course is similar to this one, but much more comprehensive with more in-depth information and quizzes at the end of each topic to test your knowledge and understanding. On the full course, you will also receive a course certificate at the end, which many auditors will be looking for. Being a medical device manufacturer, you are expected to implement a risk management process according to ISO 14971. This is the expectation from both notified bodies as well as the FDA, meaning this is something you should do if you are or are planning to sell a product to the EU or US. The goal of risk management is to create safe products. But what does that mean? Does it mean that there is no risk associated with using the device or that it is fail safe or maybe even single fault safe? Now many people would define safe or safety as free from risk. And if that was possible to achieve, that would have been great, but it is not because there is no such thing. There are risks associated with everything. Not even being alive is free from risk, and the same can be said of using medical devices. Now this brings us to the ISO 14901 definition of safety. The definition is as simple as it is ingenious, and it also communicates what you should achieve in every project or for every product. In the ISO 14901, safety is defined as freedom from unacceptable risk. That is what you want to achieve, freedom from unacceptable risk. That is indeed a very clever definition. Now, working with medical devices is both a privilege because we can make a difference in people's lives. The products we make reduce pain, treat diseases and improves quality of life. But this comes with great responsibility because when we fail, the consequences will be on others. That is a big responsibility. And in addition to risk management being a regulatory requirement, it is a strong argument for working with risk management, if you ask me. So what is risk management? Many of us would think of a table similar to this one when thinking of risk management. And this is indeed a very important part of risk management. This table is where you would document the hazards, harms, estimate risk and define how to reduce risks. Some people would refer to this as the risk analysis or an FMEA. I call it a hazard traceability matrix. If you develop or manufacture medical devices, you need to work with risk management. Risk management is not only relating to the use, design and manufacturing of a medical device. You need to have a risk management process that covers all life cycle phases of your medical device, from initial conception to decommissioning or scrapping. This means that you should include risks arising from things such as poor design, failure in production processes, rough handling during shipping, misuse by a user, failure in sterilization if you have a sterile product, component failures and risks arising from decommissioning. And those risks should be taken through the complete process of risk management and be documented. Please note that your medical device may very well have different life cycle phases than in this example. The requirement on addressing risks from all life cycle phases also means that if you provide services or components or materials to a medical device manufacturer, you should also be engaged in risk management in one or another way. Working with risk management is required in the quality system regulation that applies to you if you want to sell your medical devices to the US. Working with risk management is also required in the medical device regulation that applies to you if you want to sell your medical devices to the EU. In fact, risk management is mentioned quite a few times in the medical device regulation or short MDR. Just like the ISO 14971, MDR requires you to have a risk management system and there are a lot of requirements on what your product should be like in regards to risk and safety. These product specific requirements are found in Annex 1 in the MDR, the General Safety and Performance Requirements. So let's look at an example 
or it is you have to do in the risk management process from start to end. Firstly, you should have a procedure in your company that will tell you how you should be working with risk management. The procedure in turn should require you to make a plan for the risk management work that is to be done for a product or product group. The plan should, among other things, outline who is responsible for what in risk management. Speaking of the persons performing risk management, both notified bodies and the FDA and the ISO 4971 standard require people performing risk management to be competent, and having records proving the competence is also a requirement. This could, for example, be a course certificate from the full online course you can find on medicaladvicehq.com. For all your medical devices, you must do risk analysis. Risk analysis starts with hazards. Hazards are potential sources of harm. The next step is to identify reasonably foreseeable sequences or combinations of events that could lead to hazardous situations and harms. When you have done that, you should estimate the risk by determining the probability of occurrence of harm and the severity of that harm. This is the process which in the standard is referred to as risk analysis. The example you can see here is from a heart-lung machine and a risk that comes from a mistake being done in production. But we could and should apply the same process regardless of what type of risk we are referring to. Heart-lung machines are used for, for example, bypass surgery and they are electrically powered. So already on day one in the development of this type of product, we could say that a potential source of harm would be electricity. This is one of the key advantages of risk management done according to ISO 4901. And that is that you start with open-ended hazards that will lead you to the identification of potential risks in really early stages of the development. Based on the hazard in this example, we came up with a sequence of events where a person in production by mistake connects a live cable to ground which makes the whole device casing live. The user is exposed to electricity, which in some cases could kill you. Not every time, I admit, but it could kill you. So we write up death as the harm in this example. The next step is to estimate the risk. But what is risk? In the ISO 14971 standard, risk is defined as the combination of probability of occurrence of harm and the severity of that harm. Speaking of probability of occurrence of harm, it is very common to abbreviate it as in this example with just PO. Also severity is oftentimes abbreviated to S as in severity. We're going to start by looking at estimating the probability of occurrence of harm. Now, when you estimate the probability of occurrence of harm, you should think of your product as if you haven't implemented any risk control measures at all, meaning that the probability is fairly high. On a scale from one to five, we set it to three. I know this might feel strange to do, but it is both a good idea and a requirement to estimate the probability of occurrence of harm before risk control measures. The severity is based on the harm, which in this case was death. This will be the highest severity, meaning five on another one to five graded scale. This should not come as a big surprise. This results in an unacceptable risk in the risk evaluation matrix, here indicated with NACC, short for not acceptable. The risk evaluation concludes that this risk is far from acceptable. The next step would be to look at what we could do to reduce this risk. This is called risk control options analysis. The most effective way of reducing risks is to completely take away the hazard, in this case the electricity, but we are not going to resort to having heart-lung machines with hand cranks only, so the electricity would have to stay in there. What we could do, however, is to apply protective measures, which is the second most effective way of reducing risk. The detailed solution to this risk would be to design the cable so that they cannot be connected to ground thereby ruling out connection errors. We should also perform a final test in production that includes electrical safety tests that would detect this kind of mistake. Now that we've decided what to do, we need to prove that this actually works like intended. This would be called verification of effectiveness. We would be analyzing the cable connection errors to ensure that there is no way we can connect the cable incorrectly. This could be done either theoretically or practically or both. Regardless of how we do it, we should keep records of it. We would also like to prove that the final test actually does detect this kind of error. To do that, we might bring in a cable with the wrong length that would actually allow us to make an incorrect connection and then test the device and make sure that the final test detects it. This would be a fault injection test. 
Now, if you do this type of testing, make sure you don't electrocute yourself or your colleagues. Even though we have decided what to do and we check that it works, we also need to make sure that we have actually implemented these risk controls in the product. Maybe you tested the electrical safety tester but never put it into production and started using it in the final test. And what good would it do then? In this example, you can see the column with an abbreviated implementation. This is where we will check off that we have actually done what we said we would do. And then lastly, in risk control, we should estimate the residual risk and determine whether the risk is now acceptable after the risk control measures have been implemented. In this case, it is, which is shown with the green color and the letters ACC, short for acceptable. Risk analysis, risk evaluation, or risk control would not be just a single row of text like in this example. It's likely to be at least 100 rows with risks relating to the various types of risks that would be present throughout the life cycle of your medical device. And that should be risks from any of the life cycles between initial conception and final decommissioning. And that was a brief overview of risk analysis, risk evaluation, and risk control. If you need a template of the table we just looked at, then look for hazard traceability matrix on medicaldevicehq.com where you can download the table for free. After having worked with risk management in your new product development project, there are three things you need to ask yourself. Firstly, was the risk management implemented appropriately and according to what you plan in your risk management plan that was mentioned before? If not, go back and do it right. The second question relates to whether the overall residual risk is acceptable. It might be that all individual risks are actually acceptable, but there are so many of them that still you cannot justify the release of the product to market. And lastly, are methods in place for collection and review of production and post-production information? Big surprise, risk management doesn't end with the product development project. It is supposed to continue for quite some time, in fact, until your product is no longer used. And you need to keep on updating your risk management file, and that should be done using data from any source you can come up with. It would definitely include data from production, complaints, post-market surveillance, and updates of your clinical evaluation report. The results of your risk management review should go into the risk management report. At the end of your development project, you should also establish a risk management file, which is a set of records and documents that are outputs from your risk management process. A practical way to define what is part of the risk management file is to create an index pointing out all the documents and records that are relevant to risk management. Thereafter, you should continue with production and post-production activities. Sometimes you will learn frightening things like about risks that you did not identify and sometimes you will learn good things, for example, that certain risks don't occur as often as you thought they would. Production and post-production activities are about closing the loop to make risk management a continuous life cycle process, meaning that we keep updating our risk management file to make sure that it is accurate and up to date. In this image, you can see how production and post-production activities feed back information into the risk analysis, risk evaluation, and risk control processes, which is exactly what should happen over and over again. On a side note, this is an area in the new standard that has been expanded greatly compared to the last version of the standard, which was not at all as comprehensive in this field. It's a very good change and update. Now that was risk management according to ISO 4901 in a nutshell. I did this very concrete, short introduction to make it as tangible as possible for you who are an absolute beginners to this field. If you're already experienced in the field of risk management, I'm sure you recognize the things that I brought up so far. Now, how does all this relate to FMEA? This is what FMEA could look like. In this example, you can see a design FMEA or DFMEA. The DFMEA looks at components and what failures of such components would lead to. In this example, you can see how design choices or design failures leads to a breakdown of system performance. The risk is measured using an RPN number, which is short for risk priority number. The highest ranking risks should be addressed first by mitigations. And just as in the case of ISO 14901, the residual risk is estimated again using the same technique as before mitigation. Having looked at these examples, you may have noticed that FMEA starts with details or components. You would be looking at how specific components or process steps could fail. And there was no mention of harm in this FMEA, was there? And since we've only looked at failures, risks relating to normal use have not been included. Let's compare this with ISO 4901 risk management and highlight some of the major differences 
to FMEA. Risk management, according to ISO 14901, will look at risks arising from both normal and fault conditions, whereas FMEA will only consider risks arising from fault conditions. And since FMEA starts with components or process step failures, by definition, it won't be possible to start until the design or production processes are fairly well known, which means in a late stage. ISO 14971 risk management, on the other hand, starts with hazards that can be identified at really early stages in the design lifecycle. Lastly, ISO 14971 will manage all risks from all lifecycle phases and both normal use, reasonably foreseeable misuse, and in some cases even abnormal use, whereas FMEA only aims to improve reliability of the design or process. So now you've seen the major differences between ISO 14901 risk management and FMEA according to the IEC 60812 standard. It's important to remember that if you only use FMEA, you do not meet the requirements of the ISO 14901 standard, and this in turn usually means that you do not meet the requirements of the medical device regulation, nor are you likely to meet FDA's expectations on risk management in the US. Thanks for watching this short course. Do you need templates to give you inspiration or do you require more knowledge on risk management? You can find free risk management templates or you can purchase the full Introduction to Risk Management for Medical Devices and ISO 14971 2019 course on medicaladvicehq.com. We offer online courses, public classroom courses, as well as in-house training on risk management, design control and project management for medical devices. Drop us a line on support at medicaladvicehq.com if you would like to learn more about your options or receive a proposal, or email me on the same email address if you have a question relating to risk management, or share what you think is most challenging in risk management. I hope to hear from you.